Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Uh, amma ba'd. Ahabatu fillah. Continue on in our study of Bulugh Maram. Kitab al-Nikah. The Book of Marriage. Uh, the chapter of Li'an. Uh, we reach the hadith of Sahal ibn Sa'd. Radiyallahu ta'ala an. This is the 940th hadith. Narrated Sahal ibn Sa'd radiyallahu ta'ala anhu concerning the story of the two, the husband and the wife, who invoked curses regarding one another. When they finished invoking curses regarding one another, the man said, I shall have lied against her, O Messenger of Allah, if I keep her as a wife. He then pronounced her divorce three times. Even before Allah's Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam commanded him to do so, mutafakun alayhi. This is a hadith uh, in Bukhari and Muslim, and the topic of this hadith is to show that although uh, in in the situation of Li'an, that it is not necessary to pronounce uh, uh, talaq to pronounce talaq because the uh, in in this situation that the uh, when Li'an takes place as we mentioned prior to this in the prior lessons that uh, the separation is a permanent separation they're they're permanently separated meaning that their marriage has reached to such an extent to to such a level of of discord if you will that uh, and with this great such a grievous accusation uh, of, of adultery that there is really no no way to reconcile at, at that point that it, it's very serious and it shows us the difference between Islam and some other practices of individuals that for them the uh, adultery is light so that they it, it, you know they don't have any uh, rulings or a Sharia in essence to follow but Islam has given us uh, is a complete way of life and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed us and gave us the uh, best of examples on how to deal with these situations. Because in that situation, if you look at it from a point of hikmah, that the trust would be uh, completely destroyed. There will always be some effect. Even if there's toba, even if there's reconciliation on behalf of both parties, that there will always be something uh, contained within the hearts. It would be almost impossible to remove that because they reached such a state to where they were willing to, uh, to where they made curses uh, upon themselves that they were telling the truth about the, uh, the issue at hand and the issue also being a grievous issue as we mentioned. What we learned from this hadith, one of the, the main benefits of this hadith is that after uh, as some of the scholars mention that it's permissible to pronounce talaq uh, after li'an takes place even though as we mentioned it's not it's absolutely not necessary because the it's you're they're already separated a permanent separation but they deduce from this hadith that it's permissible to make the talaq because the man did so and then at the end of the hadith uh, uh, it was mentioned Ola, uh, he said uh, O Allah's messenger if I keep her as a wife and the, he, he then uh, he, or he said finishing of own curses one another uh, the man said I shall have lied against her, Allah's messenger, if I keep her as a wife. He then, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, pronounced her divorce. Three, uh, then the man pronounced the divorce three times. So this shows that this was a, a permissible act, or else the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, would have made inkar. He would have uh, said that this was impermissible, you know, to teach his ummah. In the uh, the next hadith, 
narrated uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, My wife rejects no hand of a man who wishes to touch her. He said, Banish her. He replied, I am afraid my soul may desire her. He said, Then enjoy her, reported by Abu Dawood and Al-Bazzar, and its narrators are reliable. An Nisa'i reported it through another chain from Ibn Abbas anhu, with this wording. He said, divorce her. He replied, I cannot endure the desire for her. He said, then keep her. So this hadith shows us, it illustrates for us, the ruling with regards to uh, keeping a woman who has some deficiencies in a grave matter which has to do with, uh, you know, in, in essence, mixing with men, or even greater than that. And so this hadith, in the statement, where he said, my wife rejects no hand of a man who wishes to touch her. This has, uh, this implies two different meanings. The, you know, in, in fact, in the Arabic, it's it's uh, in the asal of the text, it's it's a kind of it, uh, is it has more ambiguity in the statement. So, uh, it has uh, potential more than one potential meaning. Firstly, the first meaning is she is a loose character with strangers, uh, and then the second meaning is that she is an adulteress. Another pr uh, possible meaning is that she is not a good custodian of his wealth and the first meaning is the closest to being correct uh, if the second meaning was correct the accuser would have had to produce witnesses or li'an would take place or the woman would have to be punished however none of this happened on the contrary the prophet وسلم, ordered him to tolerate her if the second meaning was correct, it means the Prophet ﷺ had permitted him to be a day youth because we have other nusuls where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the one who has a loose wife, who is um, uh, doesn't care about the moral behavior of his wife, that this he referred to them as a day youth and almost like a, a type of pimp. And so here, uh, this is why... Uh, the scholars, or at least some of the scholars have ruled out mm -hmm. the second meaning that she's an adulteress because then there would have been uh, uh, rulings uh, applied to that situation which would have showed, uh, you know, that it was a serious matter uh, in any, at any uh, hand but that would have been, uh, become very clear with a the HUD or some sort of serious ruling being applied to her. From this hadith, some of the fawaid of this hadith, there are many uh, benefits of this hadith, many uh, lessons that can be derived. And some of the benefits of this hadith, for one, is it shows that the Sahaba were very straightforward when it came to uh, knowing the truth and describing a situa uh, particular situations. Because this Sahabi, radiallahu ta'ala, and he said, in the imra'ati la, turad, uh, la turaddu yadalamis, yad that verily my wife does not uh, refuse to be touched, in essence, or to, you know. So he was very direct in this situation. So it shows that the Sahaba when it came to ascertaining the truth, to finding the truth, to asking about the truth, to asking about a hukum or a ruling, that they were very straightforward. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that uh, a person, uh, that if a person uh, mentions something uh, that he detests, while gaining a fatwa, that this is uh, permissible, and this is not considered riba, something that he dislikes or something 
that someone else dislikes or something, that this is not uh, riba in this situation. Uh, because if they are earnestly seeking a fatwa and they are, you know, it's something which is actually uh, necessary to know, it is not always necessary to mention names and so forth, but however, if, uh, if it becomes necessary, that it shows, this hadith shows that it's permissible because he was talking about the situation of his, his wife. So if there is maslaha, overwhelming maslaha, and this is the point, is that it requires having some fiqh fideen, to having some understanding of the religion, to understand when it's going to actually be a situation of mas uh, maslaha and benefit, to find this hukum because you need to know or whether it is a situation of actually backbiting that or that you're giving unnecessary information about uh, someone uh, in a situation and for example we could have, we have situations from time to time sometimes there are uh, sisters that are seeking information from a, a, a scholar or from a student of knowledge uh, about their husband, for example, the, you know, many situations that have arisen in Karamakum Allah, sometimes even as serious as anal sex or something like this that takes place in the household. And the wife maybe not being very versed in the religion, but knowing and feeling that this is a wrong activity or wrong practice, uh, or, or the husband could have even beautified it for her or deceived her with this, then she may ask about the situation. In this situation, is it necessary to mention his name? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But however, uh, to, you know, it becomes necessary for such a grievous crime to mention the situation. However, another situation perhaps might be a woman or a man seeking to find out you know, a, a ruling about a particular issue and then they give too much information to the sheikh, meaning they give information about the name of their spouse, uh, my spouse is da 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 from such and such country, and they they did this. Okay, it may not be necessary. That may be unnecessary information. So that's how you want to uh, be cautious of falling into riba and going beyond the bounds of maslaha of of finding the 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 benefit in order to rectify the situation. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that there are some women that were present during the time of the Salaf al-Saleh rahimahumullah ta'ala or even perhaps some of their wives and so forth who might have been uh, uh, weak in this, in this uh, affair as is mentioned in this hadith this is a Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala who had a wife like this who uh, liked to uh, was not uh, was 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 very weak and accommodating as far as uh, being either mixing with men or being actually kind of touched by men or maybe shaking the hands of men and things like this. And uh, so this uh, shows that this also uh, was the case during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that there were some situations like this. Another benefit that is derived from this hadith is this hadith also illustrates that when seeking a fatwa that the claim, uh, if someone is making a claim against someone else, that they are not necessarily asked they, to bring witnesses and so forth, that the sheikh is, is not going to necessarily ask them for witnesses or something they may question you know if what or or make they are going to make a hukum by what was described to them so that's why it's very important to be accurate so this hadith illustrates for us that this the claimant was not asked for uh, uh, for further proof or for um, uh, witnesses in this case which is the opposite when getting a judgment so that's very important for us to understand that there's a difference between an Islamic ruling and a fatwa. That the fatwa is not necessarily binding, you know, from a scholar. But when it comes to, uh, you know, judge, to having a judge, someone arbitrating the disputes, especially in an Islamic court 
or whatever the case may be, that this is something that's binding. So therefore, then it becomes upon the claimant, the one making the claim, that they must provide the, uh, you know, they must have witnesses or they must, uh, uh, you know, they they must have some some you know clarify. Another uh, benefit of this hadith. Is this hadith uh, shows us that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala majma'een were very uh, concerned about the, uh, you know, from their piety were concerned about the, the honor of them, their, their selves and their family and that they were not loose with regards to their women. So this is why this situation came up that this man asked the Prophet والسلام, about the situation. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that if a person finds something like this from his family, okay, and he is unable to prevent them and preserve them, you know, that they're not accepting of uh, of dawah to change and to um, uh, you know improving themselves and he is unable to be able to even uh, protect them because they're always out and about or they're always for example a woman who works in a place and it's a mixed environment and she's shaking hands and mixing with men and you know and she's very loose about that she sees nothing wrong with it she hugs colleagues all those kind of things even perhaps to this extent that a man in this situation, that if it is prolonged and she's not responsive to the to, to this dawah, uh, to this uh, to her husband uh, trying to correct her and rectify her, then it would be in his best interest to divorce her so as not to incur sin, because as a prophet ﷺ mentioned that these types of men are called uh, the youth. Another uh, benefit of this hadith. is that uh, this hadith also illustrates and shows that it's very important to look at the uh, the lesser of the two evils, okay? To analyze and, and again, this requires fiqh fideen, understand the religion. And this is because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam repelled the harm of divorce because with an, 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 a lighter mafsada, which is the man keeping her in her her weakness, or uh, uh, the harm of that would it, if it would have incurred to the man's heart, so the man's heart was attached to his wife. This was the the point in that hadith. He loved her a lot, and he was moved by her. So, and she was a woman who had, uh, in their standards, uh, some loose qualities. And so he felt that he would have been, he couldn't live without her. He would have kind of been destroyed if he would have had to divorce her. So that's why when the Prophet ﷺ said initially uh, what he said, that the man said, you know, I, I can't uh, do that. I fear that I would, you know, I, I will conti continue to, to follow after her and be attached to her. So the Prophet ﷺ, viewed the lesser of the two evils and, and determined sallallahu alayhi wasallam that the lesser of those two evils was to let them uh, remain together so as not to destroy this man's heart because that might affect his ibadah you know he might leave off worship might leave off being a Muslim he might uh, uh, you know anything could happen there could be all kind of, of of harms greater harms that can result so this was the lesser of the two evils was him to uh, stay in that uh, in that marriage, and uh, you know, in hopes of rectifying his wife. Uh, another benefit and, and, uh, of of this hadith is that this hadith, as we've mentioned countless times, al amr fi al wujub. That whenever there's a command in the Quran and the Sunnah, the asl, the origin of that command, is that it's an obligation. This hadith 
uh, goes against that that principle or shows us another aspect of that principle is not illustrating that principle so in this case because there was uh, the Prophet used the imperative form you know use the command form however it was in regards to permission the man was seeking permission so when in seeking permission and then there was a command form this does not show that this was an obligation nor does it show that it was even recommended and 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 where this is illustrated is because the Prophet ﷺ said, فَاسْتَمْتِعْ بِهَا فَأَمْسِكُهَا The Prophet ﷺ said, uh, you know, enjoy her and remain with her. So this was not a command in that the Prophet ﷺ was ordering him and that it was an obligation upon him or ordering him and that it was necessarily mustahab or recommended for him, but rather this was a way and a means for dealing with his particular issue because this man uh, sought uh, advice or sought permission. So this was the Prophet ﷺ given permission and it was not uh, the case of the uh, in, in the situation of the asal of that that principle. Uh, and this falls under uh, a, a principle, and this uh, principle in a sula fiqh, it is that al amr an al amr bad al nahi, o amr bad al bad al istadhan yufid al ibaha. So this is a a principle. So this hadith also illustrates this qaida or this principle in a sula fiqh, which means that when there's a command after a prohibition meaning that there's a prohibition and then there comes a command for the same affair or that there is a command after someone is sought permission for something this shows that this is not a command to do that thing but rather that it that thing is uh that per, uh that that is permissible it is ibaha so in those situations, that shows and illustrates that that uh, command, although it was in the command form, the imperative form, it shows that it was uh, ibaha, that it was permissible, not a situation in which it was recommended or a situation in which it was an obligation. A last benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, also illustrates that perhaps the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, although we don't have the evidence for this, but this is a, a benefit Ben Othimin mentioned, is that perhaps on another situation that we're unaware of, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam may, uh, you know, in this hadith, kept silent and allowed for the man to be, you know, gave him permission to remain with his wife because of the harm that would have incurred, he would have endured by separating from her, uh, that perhaps on another um, uh, occasion the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised him to do so with the fade, with the the restriction of making sure that she is trying to improve herself and that you're active in trying to help her improve herself, meaning get her away from that sinful behavior. So that it isn't just a matter of just staying, you know, just protecting that harm, but rather from what we know from the other evidences from the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he, uh, you know, that the deen is all about rectification and that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the most proactive in rectifying situations. So in a situation where there was a marriage that had some dysfunctionality like this, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from what we know from his Sunnah in general, is that he... Uh, rectifies so perhaps on another occasion that we don't have evidence for he could have you know emphasized to that man that he should work on rectifying his wife and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best in the next hadith narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an he heard Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say when the verse about invoking curses came down 
any woman who brings into a family one who does not belong to it is not an observer of Allah's religion. And Allah will not admit her into his paradise. Likewise, Allah will veil himself from any man who disowns his child while he knows that it is his child and will humiliate him in the presence of the first and last creatures. Abu Dawood and Nisa'i and Ibn Majah reported it and Ibn Hibban graded it as authentic. Uh, with relevance to this hadith, we'll read the, the, the next hadith because the subject matter uh, is overlapping sub subject matter. So in the 943rd hadith, which is the next hadith, narrated uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala If anyone acknowledges that he is the father of his child, just for the blinking of an eye, he has no right to disown it. Al-Bayhaqi reported it, the hadith is hasan or good, and mawquf, meaning it's a statement of a companion, the statement of Umar radiallahu ta'ala in these two uh, narrations, one of the important, uh, or the subject matter of why it is in the chapter of Li'an is because it deals with a, a situation where there is doubt, and then from that doubt, uh, there can result the accusations of adultery and... Uh, and Zena and so forth and then this uh, from this is the result is the hukum of Li'an so this is in line with the other narrations we've been studying in this chapter and this is why this hadith or these narrations are in this uh, chapter so in the first narration uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala he said he heard Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say when the verse about Li'an, uh, invoking curses, came down, uh, he, the Prophet ﷺ said, Any woman who brings into a family one who does not belong to it is not an observer of Allah's religion, and Allah will not admit her into paradise. So in this statement here, uh, this statement means, by a woman not uh, bringing someone into a family who does not belong to it, means that she has... Uh, committed adultery, that this is a situation when a woman has, uh, you know, committed adultery and she has uh, hidden that and then had the child and brought it into the family when it is, uh, it is not from the father and it is not a part of that family. And uh, so in, in this sense, this uh, illustrates uh, you know, the seriousness of this matter because this uh, matter has an effect on many ahkam in the Sharia. Many ahkam such as uh, inheritance, um, uh, you know, inheritance as well as uh, all, all kind of the legacy and the name of the, you know, of carrying the name of the, the parents, uh, the father, uh, many other uh, issues result uh, for in a situation like this where there is an illegitimate child and it has been lied about so that it is not really from that family or not really from that father. So there are many uh, problems that arise from that. And with that being the case, this shows the seriousness of this matter and that it is a major sin. And that's why Allah, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, any woman who brings into a family who does not belong to it is not an observer of Allah's religion. That's a very serious statement from the Prophet ﷺ, meaning that this person does not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This person is not a person who adheres in Tamesic, uh, you know, that, that adheres uh, staunchly to the religion of Islam. It does not mean they are a disbeliever. So it's very important that we understand that, that this statement does not mean that this person is disbelieved, they have left the fold of Islam, but rather this is a stern warning letting them know that this is not a person who's on istiqamah, this is not a person who is on straightness and observing the religion uh, properly. 
And the Prophet وسلم, also said, and Allah will not admit her into his paradise. So there's the threat of wa'id, this threat of a severe punishment. And so from that, that statement, some of the sects, like the Khawarij, would take that to mean that she is no longer a Muslim because, of course, all Muslims will enter paradise. That if they, if they die upon Islam, even if they were a major sinner, such as this case, that they will, even though there's a threat of punishment, and perhaps they may be punished, and as we spoke about before, they're under the, their tahta mishiyatillah, they're at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If He wills, He will forgive them, and if He wills, He will uh, punish them. But however, for this major sin, uh, it, it is something which is worthy of punishment, but that does not mean that they will never enter paradise. This does not mean that they will never enter paradise, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And then the Prophet said, Likewise, likewise, Allah will veil himself from any man who disowns his child while he knows that it is his child. So this is the case that a man, he uh, denies his own child. And sometimes this is the case uh, due to severe ignorance and greed and selfishness that you find some fathers they do not want to claim their own children and that they deny that those children are even theirs when they know that they are theirs and this is the case where the prophet والسلام, said he said likewise Allah will veil himself from any man who disowns his child while he knows that it is child so that means there's no doubt with this individual that this is their child but they have denied it and if they if they know if they have knowledge of something and they deny it, this shows uh, arrogance and a severe ignorance and an evil characteristic that they are uh, denying this responsibility and denying the lineage of their own child, and so it shows us the seriousness of such a sin and the repercussions uh, that will be in the hereafter. And then the Prophet said, and, and will humiliate him in the presence of the first and last of creatures. Meaning that the person who does this wicked sin, the man who denies his own children outright, denies that they are his children, and he knows that they are. Meaning that there was no doubt in the case. Uh, it wasn't a case of his wife was a loose woman, a, a, an adulteress, committing zina here and, and there. And so he has legitimate some sort of legitimate reason for thinking that this may not be his child, but this is a case a woman, he, he knows that this is his child. There's no uh, room for uh, debate in this uh, matter or this affair, and it is clear that this is child, and then he denies it. So it shows that in the hereafter, there is a severe punishment for this individual. Some of the things we gain uh, from this uh, these narrations, the first thing, uh, one of the first benefits that we gain from this, uh, from these narrations, uh, is that that it is one of the major sins for a woman to uh, claim a child is from uh, a people or from a particular father. And it is not the case, meaning that she has done this major sin uh, and there is a severe punishment for this, uh, this, this case. And we already mentioned because it has to do with uh, issues of inheritance, issues of, of, of um, you know, the, the, the people who are the, uh, uh, being a uh, mahram. Uh, many, many issues that result uh, from this uh, situation, also issues of nafaka, meaning issues of, uh, of, um, of paying for the, the child, the, the child support and spending, that this is also becomes a situation because if the child is not really uh, belong to a man, a particular individual, he, then he's not... Uh, you know, obligated to take care of that child. That is not his obligation Islamically. So there are many problems and issues that result 
and uh, from this major sin. So this shows us it's a major sin and that it is a source of fitna. The second benefit we gain from this hadith is that from the punishment for certain sins like this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself frees himself from individuals like this. So this is a very serious Serious thing to have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distance himself subhanahu when he created you from you because of your sins. Because you've done something so grievous and so horrendous. And so this is uh, shows that it is it is a very serious uh, situation. And this is evidence in this hadith uh, from the statement Falaisat min Allahi fi shay. That Allah that this person has no uh, relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatsoever because the grievousness of their, their crime. Uh, another benefit of this hadith or of these these uh, the hadith and the athar is this uh, the first hadith affirms for us of course if battle Jannah that Jannah is uh, a, a reality and this is an affirmation in this hadith and this is a part of the Iman. This is a part of Iman. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is, uh, and the ether, is that it is also a major sin. It illustrates for us that it's a major sin for a person to uh, free themselves or from their own child. Okay, that this is one of the major sins and a wicked crime, which should not be something uh, complex to understand that it should be well understood of the heinousness of such a uh, of one freeing themselves from their own child and we see many cases uh, especially amongst non-Muslims where they uh, have these these types of situations throwing away children things like this but unfortunately this happens in the Muslim world as well and that's why we have these ahkam on how to deal with these situations and obviously, they have relevance for us, not just because we, we these situations do happen, but also it's from a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Let us know what happened in the Prophet ﷺ's time when the Prophet ﷺ was living. Those are some of the main benefits of those narrations. In the next, the next hadith narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an, a man said, O Allah's messenger, my wife has given birth to a black son. He asked, have you any camels? He replied, yes. He asked, what is their color? He replied, they are red. He asked, is there a dusky or dark one amongst them? He replied, yes. He asked, how has that come about? He replied, it is perhaps a strain to which it has uh, reverted, meaning due to hereditary. Uh, he said, it is perhaps a strain to which this son of yours has reverted. Mutafakun uh, alayh. This is in Bukhari and Muslim. A narration by Muslim has, he was intending to disown him. Muslim concluded the hadith as follows, he did not permit him to disown him, meaning the Prophet وسلم, did not uh, allow this man to disown his child just due to a difference in color. Some of the benefits of this hadith is this hadith in general, the meaning of this hadith, it shows that a, a Bedouin man uh, came to the Prophet وسلم, and he was the owner of camels, which was very common obviously in that time and in, even in contemporary times uh, you have the Bedouins their most prized possessions mostly are their camels and this man came to the Prophet Sallallahu with this very strange question and he basically was saying that my wife she has had a, a child that is, is black and the implication is that he was very fair-skinned or white-skinned and that his wife was very fair-skinned or white-skinned. 
So he was wondering, you know, this is this is a very strange thing. So he was ready to divorce his wife to uh, to free himself from his wife and to, to, to dissolve their family because of this. Because this is very strange for him that his child would be different different than him and his wife in color. Very strange. Which for most of us, this is strange. If if a black couple or a brown couple has a white child or a very very fair skinned child, this will be a very strange. Occurrence people say, you know, what's going on here is it you know, so this caused uh, this for this man this Bedouin there this was a source of suspicion and With that being the case he went to the Prophet and asked what he asked or or, or said what he said um, in, in, in this situation and the Prophet with his hikmah and his wisdom illustrated for the man and gave the man food for thought and did not accept the man uh, uh, removing himself from his wife. Uh, the relevance of mentioning this hadith in this chapter of Li'an is due to the fact that it is uh, to show that it is not permissible for a man to just... Uh, make this claim of, of, of adultery how seriousness how serious it is as we mentioned in the prior ahadith that we, we studied in this chapter of how serious how serious it is to make a claim of uh, uh, adultery against one's spouse against one's wife and this also shows the reason that this is monastic or irrelevant for this chapter uh, especially in the sense that, this, uh, it is showing that just because there's a difference in color even, that this is not sufficient, that in and of itself, to make this claim against one's wife. To show, so the, it shows how seriousness, how serious this uh, is. And then to go, to move on to the next stage, which would be to make li'an. Just because of this weak, uh, uh, doubtful issue. Some of the uh, benefits of this hadith is firstly that uh, this hadith uh, shows that if someone finds a legitimate reason to doubt something, then there's no sin on them if they express some doubt. Because the man, he had a legitimate reason, it would be a strange thing for any of us if they were to have a child and the child looks very different from them. From the from the husband and from the from both the parents, so this could be a reason for doubt. So this hadith illustrates for us that if a person has a legitimate reason to doubt something, whatever the case, not just in this uh, related to uh, this issue of having a child that uh, looked different than them, but in any situation, that if they have a legitimate reason, then there's no sin upon them for having uh, a doubt. Another benefit of this hadith is that it shows that also that the difference in color between the parents, both parents and the child, can be a reason for this doubt to occur. Okay, because it wasn't just that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ didn't make ankar or, or negate the man's feelings, but rather he showed him through wisdom that this is entirely possible because many of us are... are are uh, through in through heredity, uh, you know, through our uh, our great great grand great grandparents and so forth, probably differed in the, in the way they looked from us, and in fact we all came from Adam alayhi But yet we are so different as people. Some are Asian, some are African, some are uh, you know uh, European, some are whatever. People have very different uh, nations and tribes. And what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? We created a new nations and tribes so that you would get to know one another. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that it is uh, also very relevant and pertinent and important for the mufti, for meaning someone being asked questions, for them to look at the situation of the person asking the question, the mustafti. So that 
win a sheikh or an alim or whoever that has knowledge that you are trusting uh, especially those, of course, that are that have the right to make fatwa, fatwa, or you know have the the prerequisite knowledge with regards to the issue that you're dealing with, that they should uh, you know look to your situation when answering. It's very important, and this is a very important issue that we see with regards to people who ask for fatwa from scholars from different countries and so forth that those scholars need to be it needs to be made known to them the situation of the people that they're making fatwa for and the particular the issues relevant to the question and the society in the background as is a a, a principle a hukum ala shay fur and ala tasawwurihi that a part of making a ruling on something is having a correct understanding of that having correct background knowledge and in this um uh, in this light, uh, uh, another situation was when a man, he came, uh, he wanted to embrace Islam, or he embraced Islam, he was a new Muslim, and he, uh, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or he, actually he didn't embrace Islam, but he wanted to embrace Islam, and he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, you know, I, I want permission to commit zina, because I'm, I'm very... You know, I, I really like the women. That was his situation, basically. He could not leave it. He felt like he just couldn't leave it. That was one thing he could not leave. So he asked for permission from the Prophet wasallam to commit zina, to be, to be, to continue on in this activity, and he'll be a Muslim. And the Prophet wasallam used hikmah and wisdom, and this is from the point of being the mufti, that the Prophet wasallam said, uh, would you be pleased with you with doing that with someone doing the same situation with your mother? He said no. What about with your sister? He said no. What about you know you know your female uh, your daughters? The man was absolutely no. So this the Prophet Sallallahu made uh, you know from his hikmah looked at the 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 condition. Of the person asking the question, he didn't just write out say, "No, this is crazy. This is a horrible sin. No, you shouldn't be Muslim." But rather, he showed him in a way that this Bedouin would understand, with imparting wisdom and understanding his how, understanding his situation. And the Prophet wasallam used his wisdom to deal with that and give this man Dawa the appropriate way, so that the man could understand and hopefully refrain from this and become Muslim. So those are some of the main benefits derived uh, from this hadith. Uh, a last point I do want to make is that also uh, from this hadith is it shows us that it is uh, very important for a person to strive to remove uh, doubtful issues when, when doubt comes to them, to remove the doubt. That to yazil al-shak bil yaqeen, to remove doubtful things with certainty. And those are some of the main benefits of the